So, Kit, thank you so much for joining us for an Audible Sessions interview about your brand new book, Without Warning and Only Sometimes. Thank you very much for asking me. It's great to be here. So this one is a memoir. You're known for your fantastic fiction writing. Explain the title to me. Why, why is it called Without Warning and Only Sometimes? Um, that really epitomises my childhood, that good things uh, would happen without warning and only sometimes, and bad things would happen without warning and only sometimes. You could never predict when you would eat, when you would be warm, if there would be clothes to wear, and if they were, what would they look like? It was very haphazard. It was very unpredictable. And we just sort of existed in this no routine, nothing dependable um, world, which was both good because it made you made life interesting. Um, but it was also bad because actually you do need to know that there's going to be dinner every day. And there's, we certainly did not know whether there was going to be anything to eat from one day to the next. Mm. And you write that your parents were both waiting each for their own paradise. Yes. What paradises were they waiting for? Um, my father came to um, England in 1957 and he came to England to make money and return to St Kitts in the, in the West Indies because it was paradise. It was not paradise with no money and that's how he had experienced mm. But he knew that it was paradise and it certainly looked like paradise if you had a beautiful house on a hill and you had some money. So he was waiting to go back to paradise. My mother became a Jehovah's Witness when I was six and Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Armageddon will come, wipe all the badness from the earth and paradise will follow. And she completely believed that that would happen in 1976. And she spent, I certainly spent my childhood and she spent her life waiting for that paradise to come. So they had completely, they're on different paths completely. My father to go home to the West Indies, my mother that paradise would come and make her world fantastic. Mm. How do you cope as a kid with the idea that Armageddon's coming and you're never going to grow up properly and do um, anything you want to do? Badly is the answer to that. Put it this way, if you're a good kid, you live with the promise of everlasting life and it's wonderful. I was not a good kid. I used to steal money out of my dad's trouser pocket. I used to swear. I used to fancy boys. I had a, my first cigarette when I was 10. All of those things made me think I was bad. And because I was bad, I was going to die when Armageddon came. So you lived with that threat all the time and it made, it was a very uneasy feeling. So I used to go to sleep sometimes thinking Armageddon might come in the night and kill me. Um, and then when I left home when I was 16 and I thought, well, Armageddon's going to come at any minute, I had to pack in all the bad things that were there. You know, if I'm going to get, if I'm going to die, then absolutely do all the bad things that you can before you die. Mm. The, all the forbidden fruit, taste it all. And growing up with your mum as a Jehovah's Witness, when you couldn't celebrate birthdays, you couldn't celebrate Christmas. What was it like when you left that and you could do those things. How do you feel about celebrating Christmas now? Like, did you create lots of your own traditions? Well, I didn't know about Christmas, actually. I didn't know what Christmas meant because having not had Christmas until I was 17 was the first time. And then I didn't really... I was so much into sex, drugs and rock and roll, I didn't really have Christmas. But when I got married and I had children uh, and we had the first Christmas, the first proper Christmas where I was buying children's presents and I didn't know you didn't open them until Christmas Day. I thought, you sort of, does it matter when you open your Christmas present? Yes, it does. I didn't know about bread sauce. Ugh. I mean, <laughs> what a revolting thing that is and looks. And yet I'd had to do it. Whatever you, the Christmas tradition was, I had missed out on. My children had it in abundance. We had the most ridiculously big Christmas tree. I collected antique baubles. Everything, everything over the top because I'd never done it before. And also my birthday, I still haven't recovered from not having birthdays. My birthday is the most sacred day of the year. My children know they cannot forget it. They cannot just go, oh, it's my mum's birthday. It's like, no, it's my mum's birthday. She didn't have any birthdays when she was a child. So I'm very immature about it. Very, very immature. But 
It doesn't bother me. And my children just know they've got to take it seriously. Yeah. I'm still making up for lost time. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I, worth, it's worth making up for lost time, didn't it, properly? Absolutely. I mean, I've had so many birthdays, you'd think I'd be over it. But I'm not. Definitely not. And what is your relationship with religion now? Um, I'm pretty anti-organised religion for myself. I think it, it's a strange thing because I look at people of great faith and I'm very jealous. I'm very jealous that people can go somewhere like the Bible or the Quran and get comfort, get an answer, and they're willingly doing it. I was, you know, I was a, a non-willing participant in religion. People that willingly and with great faith can go somewhere and say, oh, I don't know what to do about this. Let me go and see if there's a scripture. Oh, my God, I would love it. I, I can never have that because I've been so damaged by organised religion, even though uh, Jehovah's Witnesses is much more of a cult than a religion. Um, and I would like to have that faith on one hand, and in another way, I'm very glad that I don't have to subscribe to someone else's morality and someone else's version of what's good and bad. It's obviously you know, a conflicted thing with me that I love some aspects of religion, uh, the comfort, the faith, the answers, and then I really don't like other parts of it where whether you believe it or not, you've got to do it. I couldn't do that. Mm. And in the book, you write about the first time you got the nickname Kit. Yes. Which you now use so, yes. like, you know, it's on all your books, it's everywhere. Yes. So how did that begin? Um, I was... We, we were very poor. We didn't really have... We didn't really have toys and we didn't have lots of uh, amenities at home. Uh, but we had great imagination and I was singing I Can't Get No Satisfaction while I was standing on a, a table a bit like this, a, tro with a trolley that had wheels on. And so obviously doing a Mick Jagger dance, standing on this table, singing I Can't Get No Satisfaction and it fell and I hit my mouth. Um, and I didn't know at first that I had bitten off most of my tongue and I had to go to hospital and have it sewn back on. And obviously it was massively swollen with these um, stitches in it and my, my whole mouth was swollen and I couldn't speak properly. So I had uh, a lisp for quite a while uh, and I couldn't say kiss. I said kith. So um, I got the nickname Kit. I mean, it was more kith than kit, but it got shortened to kit. Yeah. And you're obviously known for your fantastic writing but you didn't pick up a book apart from the bible and properly read for quite a long time so can you remember what the first book you got properly engrossed in was yes it was madame bovary by gustave flaubert so i'd read about three books before that so i would have been around 23 and i was working my way through 10 particular books that were given to me that i, that I bought or recommended to me and why it was amazing is because it the, the, the plot is about a woman who a young woman who marries a doctor. She's very, very discontent with her life. And it could not be more different from my childhood and my life. And yet I so understood her. And I didn't realise how good writing can put you not just in someone else's life, but inside someone else's skin. And I got it. I just absolutely got it. For the first time, I was Emma Bovary and I was in Rouen and I was bored out of my tree and I was like god how has he done that and you came to those books those 10 recommendations after a period where you sort of thought you might be going mad yes so what had led up to that point um I left home at 16 because if you didn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness you had to so I left home at 16 and by the time I was 21 I was knackered I was you know done a lot of sex drugs and I was like time to stop and I'd had some really horrible um episodes I should say drug drug fueled most of them um where I thought my mental health was very fragile at that point and I stopped taking drugs overnight because I was scared I thought I was going mad I was you know I was a hair's breadth away from having a breakdown and eventually I got a job and I asked the solicitor that I work for to recommend his 10 best books. And this was a man who'd spent most of his life in the army. So he recommended me 10 military books. <laughs> so it was uh, War and Peace, it was The Riddle of the Sands, uh, Three Men in a Boat, The Siege of Krishnapur, 
I can't remember the others. And then two that were nothing to do with the army and death. Um, one was Madame Bovary and the other one was Therese Racan by Emile Zola. Fabulous. Mm. And that was it. I was off. That was my reading journey started. Mm. And how did you find narrating this audiobook? Um, it's quite strange because you relive it. Yeah. You go through it all over again. And there's bits of the book that when I'm reading them, I can actually feel the emotion in my body. It's it's both terrifying and fabulous. What do you like about audiobooks? Because I think you're a fan. I think I'm a Ryan's massive fan. Massive, massive fan. So audiobooks first came into my life with my son who's got severe dyslexia. And audiobooks were a way for him to keep up with his friends who were at the time reading Harry Potter and Michael Moore Pergo. And the school was 25 minutes away, so we'd put an audio book on, drive to school, uh, and then I'd go and collect him and we'd drive home with an audio book. And so we got through 30 or 40 books and he, re I realised he understood the plot, he understood characterisation, he heard all the drama, he knew what a climax was. He, do you know what I mean? He had all this knowledge of story without ever picking up a book. And, of course, the way back to school, I'm not going to listen to Michael Moore Pergo. So I had to have my own audio book. And I, I was completely bitten. That It was... Audio books are a very, very big part of my life. I listen to at least... Uh, at least get through one a week. If you get a good narrator, you get a real sense of a performance of the book. It's not just a reading of the book. You get a sense of um, the modulation of the audio the narrator when they go quiet and they make something more exciting. And of course, if you have an audio reading, for example, of Finnegan's Wake, which is one of the most difficult books to read, um, they do all the hard work for you <laughs> because there's no, there's no sentences in there, no sort of traditional sentences in Finnegan's Wake. And I've listened to that as an audio book and understand it in a way I never did when I tried to read it. Mm. Well, people now get the joy of listening to you doing yours with all your modulation and all the different <laughs> aspects they can listen to on that. Um, Kit, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.